James Thackera, author of three major books, America's Children, Ahab's Daughter, and Book of Kings, uses the ancient powers of storytelling to bring moral coherence to one of the most devastating of modern concerns and has been rewarded by the Chicago Tribune, as in James' own words, probably an error, as without peers among living American novelists. James? Thank you for putting it that way, Catherine. Um, I, I would not want anybody to think that I had written about nuclear weapons for personal gain. Uh, and it is the fact that in my lifetime, I have not spoken publicly about it until this moment. Uh, and my lifetime embraces the nuclear age. Uh, it began for me, uh, I was born in December of 44. Uh, Hitler was still alive and the atomic bomb had not been tested. And little did I know then that one day these two subjects would become occupied decades of my life as a writer. Um, my background in this, and I'm not saying this is not credentials, it's very important that anybody listening to me, and if there's one person listening to me, I'm talking to that one person because this is a very difficult subject. It's difficult, I will try to present you a slightly different line. Because the early people, the people who built the atomic bomb, most of them now dead, they were the only people who remembered what the world was like before nuclear weapons. It has altered everything about the way we deal politically with our fate. And I have known some of those people. My family in Zurich financed, my Jewish family financed Einstein's education at the Technika Hochschule. Um, my father's roommate at Harvard ran the Berkeley Radi Radiation Laboratory and he knew Oppenheimer and Teller well. The best man in my first marriage was uh, brought up in Oppenheimer's household. I mean, I was so close to them that temperamentally this gave me access as a writer to the subject. I did not want to deal with this subject. I have never wanted to be identified with it. I think it's one of the most degrading things that's ever happened to the human species. And I think most fundamentally about this, that the human psyche is just, we're too stupid. I don't think people have been made intelligent enough yet to deal with this. And the way we've dealt with our inadequacies has actually become part of the system. I began to realize uh, what this was going to mean to me when I did, as you say, use the ancient powers. I, I had no idea that I was going to write, and I don't, I'm not a historical writer, um, but I do think that, um, and God knows, um, um, Jesus said it about parables, and uh, as it was said by Solzhenitsyn in his Nobel Prize speech, storytelling is the most powerful instrument of coming to trips of the truth that we have. And lo and behold, when I started writing America's Children, which began as a script, I had spent years documenting this thing. I've been through all the Atomic Energy Agency documents of the Gray hearings when Oppenheimer was put on trial. And I had all this documented fact. And just looking at the technicalities of writing, I thought maybe the only way to do this is to do it in novel form. And there are one or two writers that have done this kind of thing. Malro, for example, in Condition Men, which is a book I was adapted, expected, asked to adapt for film and chose, chose not to do that. But when I was writing this book, it brought me face to face with the age we're living in, the nuclear weapons age, in such a way that it was far more intense, not like the people at the SAC talks, the SALT talks, not like the people in the Pentagon, not like the people discussing this in the press, the, the, the Charlie Savages of the world in the New York Times who deal with security issues. You have to very much numb down the subliminal act aspect of things. Writers, a novelist like me, a storyteller, I don't just deal with the pure a world of pure reason, I deal with the emotional impact. And as I was starting to write this story, and I was using named characters, but I was actually thinking about the Greeks and the Prometheus and, and you know what has come down to us from antiquity. As I started writing this book, I started experiencing a terror and an anguish which I would not want to communicate to anyone. But I'm trying to communicate something of the aftermath of that emotion to me. I, I was unable uh, to spend more than about, I think I wrote the 12, 350 pages in five months. Um, because while I was writing it, I would walk through the streets and the skin would fly off the skulls of the people walking towards me. Uh, I saw firestorms all over the place. To me, you cannot have the death of the world enshrined in this unbelievable technology, this vast instrument of war that we have just sitting there, an experiment that we never have carried out yet. Now Hiroshima was small potatoes. And that, that emotion then, having known these people, 
And having experienced this thing, I then felt that I'd been ushered into a world where the only characters I could talk to sometimes were the scientists who'd built it. They're the only people who'd actually looked at it. And because I had Carl out there, I mean, I knew they were around me. And then we, got, we were moving later into this, and I went to my first Writers' Congress on America's Children in Hamburg, and I met Robert Jung, who wrote Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, and I started forming committees. I, I simply could not withdraw from this. And I began discovering some really terrible stuff. And to give you an idea of how scientists can react, I mean, they are not people without feelings either. Bradbury, who took over from Oppenheimer running the Manhattan Project, which then became Los Alamos and the Los Alamos Weapons Program. Um, when Bradbury first tested the hydrogen bomb at Eniwetok, um, they were circling 100 miles out in planes with smoke glasses on and whatever. Now this is a tough scientist, you know. They had actually wanted to see the film of Hiroshima, to see what they had done. These are people who treasure objectivity and reason. Bradbury after he circled around and he saw this thing, something going up into the stratosphere, something so gigantic that it immediately makes you think of collapsing suns and cosmic explosions in remote places. He was so horrified and stupefied that he didn't file his report for a whole week. And I thought, well, you know, this is, that is the experiment we've never carried out on human beings. And I was by that time feeling a, an intense shame to belong to a species of people who are prepared to build these instruments which will take the paradise we've been given by God, the world of children and love and happiness and striving, and turn that into a baked soil, scorched for thousands of, <laughs> thousands of yards in every direction, shockwaves, heat, contamination, with eyeless salamanders, which is what's left of the human beings crawling around on their hands and knees afterwards, and there were still a few of those left at Hiroshima after this happened. To me, to, to live with this was unspeakable. And I have had to live my whole life with it. I'm now 74 years old, and before I part this Morton coil, I want to talk about some of the things I've seen which will not be reported to you in the press. And I can just think of so many right off the bat. And um, for example, um, and I, let me put this in the context of a committee, because um, the first time I really realized how, things, how scary things have become is the time Chernobyl happened. And later on, I was to deal with the case of Vanunu in Israel, not because, I mean, I'm a Zionist, I have, to, I have this is not about regional politics, but he was a person who spent 18 years in prison for via breaking his security oath, breaking the security screen, 12 in solitary. You can find that in the Guinness Book of World Records. But when I went back to that, in that committee, I wanted it to be cross-disciplinary. We had Morris Wilkins, the DNA Nobel, Rotblatt, um, five or six people, Frank Barnaby, and uh, Tom Kibble, the head of science at Sun. And I, I heard things then which I don't think anybody listening to this will, be, will understand quite so clearly. Um, for example, um, a friend of mine who was the director of Carlsruhe University was at a meeting of Nobels in Berlin as the plume from Chernobyl came south from Sweden. The Russians denied it. Uh, the Swedes identified it on a Sunday. And in the evening, uh, a Polish Nobel wandering around in Berlin among this conference, he ran into my friend and he said, Herman, we're going to have to evacuate the whole of Poland. Evacuate the whole of Poland. And the next day, he ran into the same sign. He said, are you evacuating the whole of Poland? These are people so powerful that they can evacuate the whole of Poland. And he said, we decided not to do it because the precipitation was so uneven that if we move the population in one direction, we might move it into higher density and contamination. So that it, these are the kind of excuses that we have to deal with something so large that the human psyche cannot incorporate it. Now, um, I have done, I've been reading an article that was published on the... <laughs> I want to talk about the position we're in right at this moment because it has a bearing on some of the earlier moments I'm talking about. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times in April, it was an op-ed piece with Pinker and two other people, and <laughs> I don't know how people make editorial decisions like that, but I mean, I don't want to say anything against these three gentlemen, I'm sure they're people in good faith. They said so many things that were grossly inadequate in it, in, in it. and just, uh, just to give you one example, the sense, sense of proportion, they made the claim in this article that there'd only been three alarming to the public accidents that have taken place in the nuclear age. And anybody can identify them, we know what those three are. Well, in 1986, when I organized the committee, we were given a computer star from Amnesty International, and she hacked into the Atomic Energy Agency files in, in, 
in Vienna. And they discovered then that this is 1986. There had been 800 serious accidents reported to the Atomic Energy Agency. Because such a secrecy, such a secrecy, the, the agreement of the Concordat, the, 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 the covenant of the con is the, 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 the signatory countries have to report all their accidents, but Vienna is bound by the security procedures of each individual country. Now, the French are much more encrypted than the Russians. So, while the Chernobyl thing was happening, and I will talk to you about the Kresmaville reaction in a moment, but let's go back a little bit in this, because I'm going back and forward in my life looking at these things. When I was writing my book, I discovered something about the world we're living in just as it was coming into existence. When governments look at technological power, and since antiquity, you know, whether you have a more powerful gun, whether you have a, an archer that can go a greater distance, whether you have a rocket that has a great... These are the things that determine who's going to win. It was true of the American Civil War, actually. Um, the question of armaments is something which governments watch very closely. Governments are not particularly ethical organizations. But when they saw that they were getting what they were going to get from Los Alamos, they started wrapping it up in secrecy. Uh, the secrecy procedures at Los Alamos were absolutely extraordinary. There were rings within rings within rings. And when I did my script for this, for Original America's Children, uh, Louis Strauss, the Atomic Energy Agency, and Edward Teller were still alive. So we had to do an errors and emissions policy. And the one line that the lawyers who went over my script wanted to change was one in which Edward Teller was talking, seemed to be talking carelessly outside the security screen. And Oppenheimer says to him over a tea table, Edward, you're outside the security screen. Well, it was true that Edward Teller used to walk around the shower rooms at Los Alamos. He had been run over by a tram. He had a wooden plug in his foot. You could hear it going clunk, clunk. There were Indian cleaning women in that room who were not security cleared. He went into the next booth next to a professor and started talking about top secret thermonuclear issues he was working on. And somebody said, Edward, you're outside the security screen. Now, in terms of the trial of Oppenheimer, this turned out to be a very, very huge issue because the thing that is guarded by the governments of the world more closely than everything is secrecy. This is, in France, for example, if you become, if you're a top level of particle physicist, uh, you're given a lot of money, you're given a chauffeur-driven car, you're given a security oath, and you basically vanish from democratic society. You belong to an elite. It's a club. They play their own game in that club. They have their own awards. Everybody knows the name inside of it. We don't go in there because we're not members. And the game that they're playing in there is not golf. It's the death of the world. And uh, the people in that, uh, the people in that are, consider themselves to be highly elite. Uh, and you know, they, they're not without a sense of sensitivities about this either. But um, they, wanna, they hang together. And we weren't able, when we were organizing our committee, um, we had discussions that were considered by Morris, who had been in every Nobel's meeting in the world. He said, this is like being an Olympus. We were talking about models of the mind, security oaths, sunken submarines, contamination in the world and whatever. And while this was going on, something really extraordinary was happening in France. There is a reactor which is called the Cresmalville reactor on the Rhone River, not far from Lyon, and it was melting down. Now, you know, we were, this was in the context of us discovering there had been 800 accidents. This got onto the cover of Paris Match, but it didn't get beyond that. The, uh, the, 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 um, the population of Lyon was up in arms. They thought they were threatened. The whole Rhone Basin was threatened. If this thing, it was much larger, it was a sodium-cooled graphite reactor. Sodium, which is salt water, is highly explosive in contact with high temperatures. And the temperatures are astronomical. So, you know, in this article, which I'm quoting to you then, just, a, just a few days ago in the New York Times, these people were saying that reactors are, you know, this is not weapons, these are, these are benign, safe things. The name of the article was, uh, Nuclear Power Will Save the World. That's the name of the article. It's, it's, I mean, this is wonderful. You know, I, you know, I, I would like, if, you're listen, if anybody's listening to this broadcast, and I hope one person is listening to it, you have to hear the laughter of the gods because the gods are laughing at us for this idiocy. What was happening, I'll, I'll tell you what happened with Chris Melbourne, just as one example of what goes on inside the nuclear thing. I, I researched it. I was sitting in my committee, and um, I called up the Centre de Scientifique in Paris because they'd got the thing onto Paris Match. And they said, well, actually the way this thing started was, this was the absolute top of the grade fast breeder for, the, for, the, for the Charles de Gaulle's um, force de frappe. The French wanted to have an independent, military, nuclear military capability, and they do have that. And this was their breeder. 
and they had to put two barriers on it to make it safe. So they were impatient. The, the government was asking to have that re breeder reaction working really quickly. It was the top of the mark. So they asked the mathematicians of France to make a projection of the danger of starting it with only one barrier in place. The mathematicians of France said, one in 10,000 years. The government said, one in 10,000 years. Start it up. So they started it up with one barrier in place, and a few weeks later, the barrier ruptured and they had a leak. Now, there's a public relations disaster here. The French market their reactors to the world. They want to be, you know, like 80% reactor, reactor driven with their energy supply. They, didn't, they couldn't have this happening, a scandal like that. So what did they do? They covered up. They kept the reactor going, despite the outcry, despite the shock, despite the fact that there was the potential of a real meltdown, which would have destroyed the whole room. But, you know, and of course, when one's talking about a meltdown, it's not a joke to say that a meltdown in its extreme form could fall right through the planet. I mean, these are things that are not game theory, they're real. You know? So I watched that going on with Cape Trace Melville reactor. Shortly after that, we discovered that, um, that this man, Venunu, the Israeli physicist, had been, had been put in prison, abducted actually, for breaching a security oath. And that was something that went on in my life for 18 years, and I couldn't get involved really. I, I was not something I wanted to get involved with. Eventually, I was involved with it. Since we're talking about France, and I'm a mondialist, I love the French. I put one of my huge books centered in France. I consider it a center of virtue. And I don't disparage the French for wanting to create the force de frappe, to make themselves independent of the Americans, and even to maybe dream of making nuclear reactors work for them. But if you look at the nuclear state, and my, my hero Robert Juncker wrote Brighter Than a Thousand Homes, actually wrote a book called The Nuclear State. The nuclear state articulates itself in an, an anti-democratic or extra-democratic way. Because having liberated itself from the electorate, it doesn't have to answer to them. And the way it protects itself is with the security screen. And the security screen has metastasized. You know, if you want to say what the weapons of the world are, the security screen itself has become a weapon. And I would, you know, whatever you may think of Julian Assange, Mordecai, and all the people who are whistleblowers in this, at least they have tried to break the security screen. And many, many people see this as a problem. It doesn't just speak to nuclear weapons anymore. It is metastasized through the, through the systems of government. And it, it has been consecrated. It has been made a sacrament. It has become a, a sort of godlike special power that people who occupy those powers and feel that they have those responsibilities and that they're behaving responsibly, they don't even have to be accountable to anybody for that because they're inside the security screen. And without it, you could not, Bush could not have, 925 accredited lies, he could not have gone into Afghanistan and Iraq on the basis that he did and killed a million people. There are all sorts of things going on all over the world. The Chinese practice security screen sickness, horrible tyranny all the time on their citizens. The Russians do it. The Russians have a very different way of doing it. All these countries operate differently. All of them use the security screen in itself as a weapon. And it begins with nuclear. I would like to talk about the position we're in right now because um, these things all have a bearing on it. This article, how, how nuclear energy will save the world, is, is, is really is based on the idea that the security screen is still in place and the people outside science don't know what's going on inside it. Um, if the people outside it knew what was going on, and the reason I'm speaking with hope right now for the first time in my life and coming public is that just a week and a half ago I was in London at Marble Arch and I listened to the speeches taking place in the Extinction Rebellion. Now these are not people I normally know. There are people, a lot of them had earrings and tattoos. Uh, there are very large numbers. There are hundreds of tents around me. But the people making the speeches, the next generation, they were not, they were not like the people who I thought we'd lost, the people who remembered the time before. These were people who were prepared to listen to the truth. And so I, for the first time in my life, I feel that we're actually getting to a place where people would like to know what's going on inside the security screen. And what we're going to discover, what they're going to discover, is that the people inside the security screen have been in there so long that they don't realize that they have to confront the truth. And the people outside are looking at the truth, and they are not. And that is a very, very serious issue in these negotiations. The reason that we're approaching, I'm going to make two statements here, which seem so contradictory, and I, I'm getting towards a place where, you know, maybe I can pull all these things a bit together a little bit. 
But one statement I'd like to make to you, and I've been going back and forth for somebody who is the head of Nuclear Intelligence Week in Washington as to how much we can make this statement. I would say to you that in my lifetime, we have now reached a point that we can say the nuclear age is over. We can say it's over because the cost of these things, the decommissioning question, the fact that when you start up a reactor 20 years, 30 years, he's got his commissioning license, then it has to be recommissioned because it's so expensive to decommission it. I mean, recently at a meeting of energy people and the scientists, they were saying, we were, they were talking about the difficulties of actually returning to building. This is a country which is more sane than others and that it was actually, until recently, almost impossible to start a new reactor program here. But now we're going to new reactors because of the present regime. And, you know, if, <laughs> an aside here, let me di digress here for a moment. In terms of the original exploration of nuclear weapons, and I have to say, I'm just going back and forth because this has a lot of bearing on right now. The original idea, these were progressive, brilliant Jewish geniuses at Los Alamos who thought that by building this thing that we'd never have Hitler. Well, look what we got in the White House. Look, look what we got in the Kremlin. Look what we got in Beijing, you know. These are not the people we want in charge of this, this thing, actually. The moment we're finding ourselves in is, I would say it's over, because the concept of the nuclear age was one of deterrence, and this is an argument that can be argued in very dialectical, complicated ways ad nauseum, but um, yes, you can say that we've had a certain kind of peace. Basically, it's meant the great powers have not fought each other directly. Uh, so all the smaller countries in the world have had to fight proxy wars, and there have been lots of them, a hell of a lot of death a lot of cynicism, a lot of contempt, and a kind of nuclear imperialism has set in in, all, in the midst of all this. And I would say we've reached the end of that because, and I'm convinced I can say this with truth, and I'm thinking of that article again, that the Chinese know it's over, the Russians know it's over, the Americans know it's over. The question is, since nuclear weapons have not been used and people think, well, we can't use the damn things, it's become a game that's being played, it's game theory. These are, they're gaming the nuclear situation for advantage because the free societies are in a difficult position because they can't have their electorate knowing what's going on. The, the totalitarian societies, they don't have to worry about the electorate, on top of which they've got a hell of a lot of money which they're not giving their people, which they can keep putting in this. It's often said nuclear weapons are the poor man's enemy in Russia. Well, another great crime that's taken place in the midst of all this, and this, I would emphasize this, is that people try, and this article tried to do it yet again, support, react, support, separate reactors from nuclear weapons. I mean, 30% of Japan is, is contaminated. Uh, it's getting better, maybe, as a result of Fukushima. The amount of lying, up to six years afterwards, they still didn't know whether it was melting down. Uh, they had not created the instruments to go into the, the, the core to see what was going on. I think they've got those robots, but they were still inventing them as the thing happened. I mean, reactors are extremely dangerous. And they have, uh, I mean, mothers in, in, in Ukraine are encouraged not to have children. There's been so much thyroid. And again, this is game theory weighing in because when you measure contamination and, and its effects, you have to talk, as insurance companies do, about cluster theory. Cluster theory is not a proof of anything. It just means you have a greater, a greater a, you know, a incidence of certain kinds of things in certain areas, and you can match them up. In court, that actually is a kind of circumstantial evidence which, which has great weight, but it doesn't have weight when you're dealing with you know, power struggles between these countries. So we're, we're at a moment where, and I, you know, not to put the other argument, right now is probably the worst, most dangerous moment in terms of the nuclear age going forward because not only are we abandoning the original idea of having the nuclear weapons, we are now getting into a situation where it's being gamed and the defense budgets, the nuclear defense development budgets of the three great powers are all being increased. Putin is now handing out nuclear re reactors in Egypt and Bangladesh. He's talking about nuclear policy for the next hundred years. Does he imagine he will live that long? Um, I mean, these are people who you know, I mean, we talk about, I mean, Hitler and his thousand-year empire, now Putin's got a hundred-year empire of reactors. The South Koreans and the, um, the South Koreans and the uh, Saudis, this is most extraordinary realignment. What is Israel's relationship to that? Um, I mean, we, we are getting in a major realignments that are conducted entirely on the basis of the strategic balances. I mean, this is, this is not the original intention, even in its worst and best possible avatar. This is, um, this is reducing the human species to a, a bureaucratic, uh, a, a bu an unending bureaucratic nightmare run by people who are not prepared to face what they're doing.
the question of stupidity arises again. And you know, I, I, one could just go on and on about the danger of this, but I, I think it's really, if anybody's listening to me who's of the next generation, remember that there were people once upon a time who knew this was uh, the wrong thing to be doing. And that there was a moment where we could turn back. And if you want to know what that moment in history was, and I'm jumping around a little bit here, but this is important because this still has bearing today. In 1950, sort of time in the Korean War, the time of the McCarthy thing, um, the Atomic Energy Agency, in terms of the stages in which the security screen is imposed, the first stage is the stage of the creators. Scientists talk to each other, they don't understand security screens. Russians and Americans, they were still talking to each other uh, well into all of this. And they just realized that the governments were seizing it, wrapping it up in secrecy, and there was a meeting of the advisors. It's a famous thing in history, only known in the scientific community. Um, they had found me in Oppenheimer, a whole bunch of them got together. They wrote one of the most enlightened Olympians, like Plato's Republic, an extraordinary document saying, this is the point, we don't need to be doing this. We can stop at atomic weaponry, we don't need to be going under thermonuclear weaponry, which is on a vastly larger scale. And it was on the basis of that Oppenheimer lost his security clearance. And it's interesting that they punished Oppenheimer for removing his security clearance, the most sacred thing in the nuclear world. So he couldn't have access. You saw recently it happened to John Brennan, our present occupant. Um, so we are actually reaching a moment where the security screen, I would say, is on the verge of being breached from outside. Because there's going to be a younger generation of people, and they are not going to take this shit. The, the children of the, of the people who made this thing, like the days when Dow Chemicals were making napalm and the children refused to have breakfast with their parents, families. You know, young people are going to, you know, the young people of Russia, China, America say, we're not going to do this any longer. And they're not going to take all this condescension from inside, this so-called secret thing, which is what? It's hiding the stupidity and ignorance of the people inside it. It's not protecting anybody. So, um, I'll give you an example of how really dangerous this can be. I was originally asked to talk about nuclear waste. Now, interestingly, there is a, a, a most recent, I mean, somebody I correspond with, Victor Galinsky, is a nuclear regulator. He's a famous figure in Israel and America and, um, and a friend. And we talk about uh, Jewish history, Hebrew history, and you know, the, the Zionist movement and Herzl and thing. Um, he told me, a well, he's told me several stories that are quite alarming, but one of them is, is um, it, it was, and th this gives you an idea of the kind of personalities. I'm, I'm giving you things that are not generally known. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody's heard Victor say this before, but he knew a sack bomber. There, there have been several very, very close DEFCON calls, one, two, three, four, um, leading to a drop, a strike. And this was a B-52 bomber pilot. He was out over the Pacific, and he got to um, right to the last DEFCON call. And had he gone past that point, he would have gone into Irkutsk or wherever his target was and he would have dropped. And at the last second they were told to stand down and he flew back. And Victor spoke to him <laughs> and he said, how did you feel at that moment? And the man said, he said, at that moment I felt an intense suffering and grief because everything my life had been built for up until that moment was being denied. I was being told that it had no meaning, that I was not going to go ahead and do what I did to protect my country. This is, among all the things we discussed in my Nuclear Emergency Trust, oddly enough, odd, Nuclear Emergency Trust, my group in Article 19, which only lasted another year because uh, when the Venuna thing happened, Israel had become such an engrossing issue that it made it impossible for us to, I mean, this is what happens when you're dealing with this subject. There's so many parts to it that if you focus on any one, no human beings can actually deal with the whole thing. And the, the, way, to, the way that the people in charge deal with it is they don't deal with any of it, basically. So Victor was um, the witness for the state of Nevada over the Yucca waste repositories. Billions of dollars were put into this. And you know, if you talk about waste, I think there are nine ways to get waste off this, off this, off this planet. And I want to give you an idea what waste looks like, okay? Talking about waste is just a word, W-A-S-T-E. What does that tell you? Imagine the Capitol Dome of America, Washington, the Capitol Dome, turned upside down, filled with peanut butter, and imagine that that peanut butter is so toxic that nobody can go near it. That's out at Hanford, one of the, one of the suppliers for the atomic bomb project. There's cyclotron, the centrifuges below ground. The whole area is so contaminated they can't go into it. It's, it's an incredible, vexing problem. There have been huge commissions, vast amounts of money been thrown at it. Nobody knows how to do it. 
I mean, you know, this stuff is accumulating on the planet. In this article, this extraordinary article in the New York Times, I, everybody should read this article about how nuclear energy is going to save the world. I was so, it was poignant, it was naive, it was, it was touching, it was quaint. They, <laughs> they said something like, um, after all, you know, nuclear radiation hasn't been proven to be a problem for anybody. It's over in a couple of weeks. Well, cesium and iodine maybe, but what about strontium? What about, the, some of them are two million years? Two million years? Some of them are 100,000 years? I mean, <laughs> we're, we're creating stuff. They said it's compact. Compact? I mean, I love it, you know. Compact and compared to what, you know? Garbage from the New York uh, sub uh, skyscrapers? I mean, it's probably smaller than that. Yeah, I, I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, the point about this was, talking about game theory again, the insurance companies had to insure that repository. And Victor said, you're going to have to insure it for a couple hundred thousand years. And the insurance companies, but wait a minute, you know, we were talking about a hundred years, we can do that. Well, the insurance companies in the end, because of Victor and other people witnessing there, they refused to insure it. So they had to abandon it. Millions, billions, billions of dollars had been spent on that. What are they doing now? They're putting it in pans. I've been reassured that terrorists can't easily get into those pans. They're putting them in pans, steel, concrete pans, on reactor sites, which are in themselves not very well guarded and could ex explode. So you'd have a concentration of waste, which would then be dissipated over a landscape, which would have half-lives in, uh, you know, in extremis in them. Anyway, I hope that I'm, I'm giving you some idea of the mentality uh, the, of all this. And I would encourage anybody who lives in terror, because this thing, whether it's used or not, is an instrument of terror. And I, to sit here today is something I never thought I would do because when I was writing that book, I felt um, excruciating, intense terror because I was not able to separate all the elements of this from each other. And there's one point I was going to get to, and I, want, I don't want to leave this out of this, and in terms of the way the psychology works, even inside the heavy equipment aspect of this, is this discussion about reactors and, and, and weapons. Because if you separate them out, and there have been some, some gestures made by governments, and Eisenhower is guilty of this one. But Eisenhower was not a bad man. He didn't have the imagination. Uh, Truman, when he dropped the bomb, had only discovered about it a couple of weeks before. The secret was so well kept that the vice president of America didn't know until Roosevelt died. But Eisenhower created the concept of atoms for peace. You get atoms for peace, then you get this article saying how atomic weapons, how atomic energy will save the world. Atoms for Peace is based on the idea that reactors are something good. We will hand it out to the Iraqis. We will hand it out to everybody. That is what the IEA is doing. Saddam Hussein would not have had the equipment if he had it had he not had the IEA on his side. Maybe the Israelis are wise not to have signed up. I think they have some kind of agreement now. We're now getting to the point that half the countries in the world who are nuclear powers have not even signed up with the IEA. They're not part of the MPT. And so we don't even know what they're doing. So, you know, in terms of crime and whatever, this idea that there's a peaceful side of things and a warlike side of things is in itself a form of denial. And I'm, I hope that by now, listening to me, you will realize that esoteric knowledge, scientific knowledge, and it is hard for you to understand all this stuff, you know, it's, you have to know it. Because actually, we stole this stuff from God. You know, God obviously knew how to do this. And we do it. And we have then, since then, divided it up into different compartments so that the natural human inclination to deny, to leave things up to other people, can be reinforced. We don't know. You have to know all of it. You can't just know a part of it. You can't just think reactors are okay and weapons are not okay because all of it is now covered up by game theory. And to give you an idea of how serious this is, inside the institution, this is something you won't be know, when I had my first meeting with the scientists, a large meeting of maybe 150, down in Reading in England, it was a meeting of scientists against nuclear arms, and Tom Kibble, one of our men, who was head of Imperial College Physics, was running SANA at that time. That's where I first met Joseph Rotblatt. Uh, at that meeting, Tom came up to me at the beginning of the meeting. He said, everybody here, there's something, if we're going to work with you in my committee, which was a cross-disciplinary committee, if we're going to work with you, you have to understand that you cannot talk about reactors here. You cannot talk about reactors here because everybody in this room works on reactor projects. So the people that we're talking to, we're relying on to tell us the truth, they're all part of, they're all in the take. 
They're all part of the reactor program. That's what scientists do. And, you know, it, it, this became so terrifying to the men running Article 19 when we were having these meetings. We had writers and thinkers and political people came to the, come to the meeting. He, start saying, he started saying to me, uh, we're gonna, we don't know whether we should be doing this. You're creating alternative government. We'll have MI6 in here. Well, that is the level of tension that exists. And I saw it graphically, and I'm telling you things that you won't have seen, because if you can imagine the scene, it somehow helps you understand the problem. I happen to be outside Ashkelon prison. I, I don't want to get into discussion about regional politics. I support Israel completely. I was there because the person in that prison who spent the longest time, Klaus Fuchs, who gave away thermonuclear, well, gave away the atomic bomb to the Russians. What, he was out in seven or eight years for good behavior. Uh, Mordecai spent 18 years in the prison, seven, uh, you know, in, as I said before, 12 in solitary confinement. And when he came out that gate, the only thing that was happening at that moment was he was walking out of the security screen. Inside, he was still bound by the punishment of the security oath that he'd broken. And when he came out, he was theoretically a free man. And I didn't hear one person outside that prison. They were so wanted to discuss regional politics and everything. Nobody talked about the security screen. That is how serious the problem of denial that we are in now. So I, I hope that in having given you just some examples of what's going on out there in the world, what's going on in the science community, which after the, gray, after this, after the, the famous advisors meeting, what that represented was that the people who were trying to moderate, the people who were trying to keep a moral context on things, they were moved out. The government took over, and since then, more and more specialized people have been inside. And the kind of people who control this now are people who would not be in their jobs if they didn't agree with it. You know, if they if they were if they were talking, I'm, I'm not going to be. I would not apply for a job in the atomic energy or as the right nuclear regulator, as it's now called. Um, because I would not expect to be able to say this. I have friends who work in that business, who work at the UN, who still persist in trying to get perspective on this thing. But if you go too far and you start telling people the level of, of, of complete nonsense that we have moved into. So I hope that my making this speech to you, to this camera today, will mean that, that, we're, that we are actually arriving at a moment where the human species will speak to itself about what it intends to do in terms of destroying its future on this planet. You know, it, it, can, it can be averted. There are many, many laminations of meaning that have to be moved through. But don't deny the truth of this thing. Get to the heart of it. Try to find out what you have to understand the science these people are talking. Don't let them condescend to you. Many, many scientists have tried. I mean, Frank Oppenheimer had a popularizing. He tried to educate people in this. Some of these people are, have almost saintly stature, but nobody listens to them because it is very, very scary. Now, I, I'm hoping that the younger generation will not be afraid. They will not allow themselves to be terrorized. They will use their intellects, their brains. They will get smart. They will do it collectively. Uh, the speeches I was hearing at the rebellion, I, I mean, it was not where I expected to be hearing it from. I was always hoping it would be the government people and the scientists, but I heard it in the street. And so I, I dedicate this my little speech to you. And um, I hope you succeed. <laughs>